I could come back later, Mr. Harkin. Oh, no, no, no. It's just uh, parent stuff. It, it seems that our youngest, Chris, was on something called acid and was firing a bow and arrow into a crowd. Mm. You know how kids are. The common situation in a place like the UK for a drug like MDMA to be using three or four times a recommended dose. And with that just being the common way to take the substance, I look at that and think, well, you're just doing it all wrong. Why don't you read the recommended amount and take that amount? I can go farther and I can try to adapt what I'm saying to get them in that direction. But but realistically, if all your friends feel like that is the way to take a substance and I'm just coming at you with, hey, this raises your risk of a cardiovascular event, that's probably not going to change what they're doing. But there probably is some way to make what they're doing safer. Welcome to the Social Exchange Podcast. Today, I spoke with Seth Fitzgerald. Seth is the curator of The Drug Classroom, TDC, a website, podcast, and YouTube channel that provides education about drugs, drug policy, and related topics. The following is from Seth, which I stole from the TDC Patreon page because I couldn't have said it better. He says, quote, Usually, drug education is limited to a handful of popular substances, and it rarely teaches harm reduction. TDC's goal is to offer a more comprehensive and harm reduction-centric form of drug education. TDC makes videos, podcasts, and written content about drugs and drug policy. You can find the content on the TDC website, the TDC YouTube channel, and on iTunes. Of course, links to all of those are in the show notes. So without further preamble, enjoy this conversation with Seth Fitzgerald. Seth, thanks for being on the podcast, man. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be back. You're, uh, for people who don't know, you're the founder and the producer of The Drug Classroom, TDC. And by my most recent count, <laughs> most recent meaning I'm looking at it right now, your YouTube channel is approaching 150,000 subscribers, not to mention however many folks visit your website and subscribe to your podcast through iTunes and stuff like that. And of course, I don't just want to talk about your engagement metrics, although I would like to touch on that briefly, but I want to talk about your content. The Drug Classroom is by my best read, a bias-free educational sort of interface. And your content's about drugs, their pharmacological properties, and also the ways in which people use them, the risks and benefits within a range of dose and set and setting. And I've got to tell you, I have a nine-month-old daughter, and when she gets older and asks questions about drugs, I'm going to direct her to your podcast and information like it, because I really appreciate the objectivity and want to be sure that People are aware of you. Appreciate that. Of course. I mean, whenever I get compliments or people saying the resource is good and they're from parents or, or people in that kind of position about family members or friends, it really means a lot because even people who are more progressive about drugs, it's still pretty understandable to have a lot of hesitancy towards a different way of approaching education about them because, you know, people are worried. I mean, there are ways to get in trouble with drugs. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, it means a lot when I hear somebody say, you know, who's in that position that the resource is good enough to recommend to somebody they care about. You know, the fact that people can get into trouble with drugs, that's why I want children, people to have really realistic, balanced information about drugs. I, I don't see what you're doing is um, glorifying some certain type of behavior or another. But if you'll let me rewind for a minute, maybe I should allow us to set a foundation. Will you talk yeah, just... Sure briefly about who you are, your basis for beginning this project that you, you called the Drug Classroom. So I'm Seth Fitzgerald. I started this project, TDC, in 2014, and that was when I was still uh, late teens, and uh, now I'm in university studying biotechnology. And the sort of goal of TDC is to provide better, as you said, kind of unbiased education about drugs talk about their science and their history and their effects. And it comes at the topic from the core point of view that most of the harms people encounter for any commonly used substance are avoidable. They're not always easy to avoid. And once things like addiction come into play, people can have reduced control over their use, which makes it harder for them to just like hear about don't combine X and Z and, and actually have that implemented but overall, there are always ways to reduce harm. 
And that's the point of this education. So it's just approaching it as though the best way to educate is to not try to intentionally dissuade people from using or to promote a substance. So even though I may find something like cannabis or psychedelics interesting, perhaps even useful for people, I don't switch to being a, a proponent as a, I don't wear that as my main hat. I'm still trying to be objective about what they actually do and what the risks are and what the benefits are. Who is your audience? Do you have a target audience or is it just I've public? never had a target audience. It's kind of just whoever wants to listen to the content and, and see the information I put out. And it's turned out to be pretty wide ranging. I think a lot of the people are younger and I think a lot of the people are. Unfortunately, I haven't found a way to really target what you could say are the most at risk people, the people who are who have less access to formal education or who have less access to resources online, just people who are more likely to run into certain kinds of trouble with drugs are less likely to see my content. So I am probably mm. catering, not intentionally, but to a, a, a more educated, more wealthy audience just by the nature of the communities that have supported TDC and the kind of content that I create, which is when I'm talking about a substance, I may talk about it in a pretty scientific and detailed way for 30 minutes. And that's not really the right thing for somebody who just needs the quick facts about how to stay safe. And I'm yeah. intending to transition to TDC into something that offers both kinds of education. But historically, it's been this more scientific form. So I do think it is catering to that kind of audience who, you know, is interested in that stuff. But there are people who are just patients for when I cover medications who are commenting and they find the stuff helpful and they learn things that their doctors did not tell them. And then primarily, a lot of the people are just users, but users who happen to be the people who would be otherwise browsing Wikipedia or Arrowit or Psychonaut Wiki, these other resources to learn more about it. And the people who don't have that impulse to try to like dig into the facts and the history, I don't know how to reach them yet. So, hmm. so yeah, it is, it is kind of a self-selection for some people, but I'm not intentionally targeting any group. If you could just rid yourself of needing to adhere to what is practical, um, do you have any ideas about what would streamline this kind of information? I've been thinking about this too, and I haven't reached a conclusion, um, but what would get this kind of information to the, I mean, the most at risk, at least in, in terms of, of death, to, you know, that, that kind of a population, less, maybe less educated, maybe generally less willing to turn on an educational format, perhaps have a cumulative set of health deterioration that they need to be thinking about. I mean, how, how would one get in touch with such a, a group in, in a large range? I think the biggest way or the main way that's come to mind for me in the past is trying to reach the people who can at a peer to peer person to person level spread that information. So say somebody who works in addiction treatment or somebody who works in places that provide uh, supervised consumption facilities or that kind of stuff or needle exchange. And therefore they have an on the ground connection with a different set of users than who would be Googling to find TDC. And so if you can educate those people, then you can just generally enhance the information that's just out there. So they don't have to be watching or reading my content, but if I can educate the people that those users are talking to, then it can just eventually spread. And I think spreading that information person to person is the most effective way. Much of what we think about drugs, much of the beliefs, even in 2019, that people have about any given substance, you can slowly change that by targeting some high impact people like those who work in, in settings that work with drug users, then I think that can have a big impact. Um, besides that, I'm, I'm not sure of the best way, but yeah, if, if you have any thoughts, I'd be curious to hear what you have been thinking for how to target other groups who are otherwise not really hearing this information. I do work in the trenches, so to speak, at some point. So I have that, that at least local ability to get information to the, to, to the very population that I'm trying to give it to. But broadly speaking, no, I, I mean, your ideas are, are like mine. Have you heard about that being the case, at least about your show, that 
somebody, let's say, at, at a program or maybe a syringe exchange or something like that uses your content to provide information to people? I've actually, yeah, I've heard that a couple of times so far. People talking about having the, the videos of the podcasts playing in their facilities and then just sharing the information person to person as well, which is really cool. I don't, it, it's neat to hear that anybody in those settings is finding the content informational, but I do, I think people pick up on, it's not always the case. Some people feel like I have a bias because if, if you personally have a bad or good experience with a substance, then you hear somebody talking about it in a way that's a little less bad or a little less good, then you can think they have a bias when that's not really where I'm coming from. But for the most part, I think people hear and see the content and understand that this is a, a different way of approaching drugs. I'm not judging anybody and I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything just because it's, you know, my opinion that something is good or bad. And therefore, you know, it is interesting. I think a lot of people, even if it's not their primary focus, uh, you know, they're more interested in just living their lives and occasionally using drugs or, or consistently using drugs. They still find some of the science or history pretty fascinating. And it's just probably different and cool to hear it talked about in that way. So yeah, I have heard about some people uh, sharing the content in those settings. There's somebody who uses my podcast at a group that she heads in New Orleans. And she asked me a question the other day uh, via email that I haven't, I don't know how to answer yet. And I'm going to ask it of you now, but no, no pressure if you want to just keep thinking about it. She was asking me, Zach, do you think that, do you think that your information permeates or do you think it holds true across domains, even class barriers or situationally? Like when I talk about, what harm reduction maybe means. She's asking, do you think it means the same thing to my clientele whose life experience you really know nothing about? Or do you think maybe that your information will sound different to them? I, th I think that of course it'll sound different to a person given their experience, but I'm interested to hear your take. I don't think core stuff about harm reduction, just the, the facts about dosages and frequency and combinations, stuff like that. And obviously the facts surrounding a drug, just science and whatnot, all of that is going to apply regardless of group. But where mm -hmm. I know I have just an inherent blind spot and that probably comes through the content is take, for example, I'm middle class and, and a lot of my environmental and social factors lead to me as somebody who uses drugs having a, a pretty low propensity to in the direction of overusing substances, falling into an addictive pattern. And I can't always easily relate to people who who jump into more abusive ways of using substance. And therefore, the content doesn't always reflect the, the real on the ground scenario that people find themselves in with their own mental state. And yeah, I do think different groups of people have different, uh, there's different aspects of drugs that will be more relevant to them. And I think it would be possible for somebody like myself to eventually educate myself enough to provide all the good information. But because I'm operating in an area like addiction, more based on life experience or talking with people I know, it, it is going to be somewhat limited in that, that domain. Um, so I do think, yeah, some of the information crosses over all, all groups, but other stuff, it does need to be tailored to people where they're at you're providing a framework that people can mm -hmm. utilize and depending on their situation, the principles stay the same, but the, uh, what, what, how people use it might change. You know, the metrics might change. I might say to that woman, now that I'm thinking about it, here's the framework. You probably know your population best. So tailor it. However you, you feel is useful to this population. Yeah. And there's, there's things that come up frequently, even in the groups that I talk with, with, things like the common situation in a place like the UK for a drug like MDMA to be using 400 milligrams. And for people who don't know, that's three or four times a recommended dose. And with that just being the common way to take the substance, I look at that and think, well, you're just doing that all wrong. Why don't you read the recommended amount and take that amount? And ah. that's, I can go farther and I can try to adapt what I'm saying to get them in that direction. But, but realistically, if all your friends feel like that is the way to take a substance, 
and I'm just coming at you with, hey, this raises your risk of a cardiovascular event, <laughs> that's probably not going to change what they're doing. But there probably is some way to make what they're doing safer. You know, people who can listen to my content, hear about the science behind something and the recommended stuff, but then adapt it because they know what their friends are like, that's that's really useful. And yeah, I don't think one person with one lived experience can really just jump into any culture and start spreading information about drugs. It's going to work. When you produce an episode of your show, it's usually about a, a particular drug. You talk about both uh, legal and illicit drugs. How do you choose which drug, which substance you'll research for each show? Partly it's based on what's interesting to me, but a lot of it is constrained by what has been heavily recommended. And then also trying to just what I've done over the past couple of years is try to slowly cover, say, a substance in each category. So mm. an antipsychotic, some stimulants, some research chemicals so that there's something on TDC for every kind of drug user, whether you're taking medications or recreational substances and then slowly just fill in those drug categories because they're so large and I don't want to have a string of 10 antidepressant or 10 psychedelic videos. So just try to space it out and, and cover a range of things and then fill it in over time. But yeah, there's no, there's often not much rhyme or reason. And a lot of people ask why I haven't covered some huge substance. Like I don't have a video on heroin, but I've been around for, for five years doing this, whereas I've covered things that are much less well-known and yeah, there, there's, it's understandable why people feel that way. And I would like to cover everything. Partly, it's also just a limitation of time and resources because the videos for something like heroin, there's so much research to comprehensively cover that, that it just, those kinds of drugs so easily end up on the back burner. And I'll pick something that's a little bit easier to, to discuss so that content is released regularly and, and I'm still providing some kind of useful information. But yeah, no, there's no there's no perfect formula. When you produce an episode, like for instance, I just watched I think this is your latest about SSRIs. Was that your yeah. latest? Yeah. Yeah, about antidepressant withdrawal. Right. Yeah, you provided a hell of a lot of information in such a short time. How do you go about researching? I mean, take me walk me through what that's like and, and how long do you spend doing research for each episode? Well, for something like that video hard to say exactly how long because it was just sporadically working on it over a period of months. Mm. But on average for bigger individual drugs or a topic like antidepressant withdrawal, I'll read 200 or so research papers. And I'll usually start with review papers. If there's actually, if a topic like antidepressant withdrawal is being covered, there's a lot of good review papers out there. And then you can see the subcategories and the, the areas of nuance that should be addressed and then I'll you know search for for comprehensive papers on that specific aspect of the topic um, but initially kind of guided by by review articles just because they're very helpful and yeah it just ends up turning into a couple hundred papers to read and then I just I make myself an outline I read the full paper make myself an outline of everything that I think is relevant and useful from that and then I, I further condense that once I have a document filled with notes from all the papers, I then start to turn that into categories of information. And then I do additional research if there's something that I, I realize kind of needs to be flushed out or I need a more definitive answer on. Because it is hard to just, if you just type in SSRI withdrawal into Google Scholar, you're going to come up with 10,000 results. And you have to have some, you just have to, kind of somewhat randomly pick stuff and then also pick things that have been really heavily cited because those are likely to be influential. But then occasionally for an individual subtopic within that, the best paper has been cited one time. So you just kind of have to mm -hmm. go searching for it and, and find the latest information. So again, it's a little bit scattershot. That's why a lot of people ask to, to volunteer their time to help out with TDC. And I would love that. And it's awesome that people want to do that, but it's pretty hard. I mean, you're, you're probably getting the sense that it is kind of just my individual way of, of doing this. And there is no method uh, in a sense. And it is so crazy that it's almost hard to give anybody a task to, hey, go do this and help out because 
I just sit and, and try to get through everything. And and I just try to read enough in, in a wide enough range of stuff that I'm unlikely to be overly biased in one direction. So I, I don't go with a specific author or a specific group of authors who may have their own perspective that's getting repeated over and over again. I, I try to space it out as much as possible and read responses to articles because occasionally, especially big papers often have response articles that are published and that are kind of critical or, or supplementary. So I just try not uh, to get into a whole of, of a single perspective because it is easy. I mean, you can read, you could read hundreds of papers on antidepressant withdrawal that are exclusively critical and and really alarmist and they would be factual but they would be telling one one part of the factual story and missing this other part so it's yeah there's just a, a strive for some kind of balance and it's not it's not going to be perfect and i do add to the uh the website pages over time which is why i'm glad that tdc for the past few years has had a website not just youtube videos because with the videos they're just essentially uneditable unless I want to release a new version of something, whereas the website pages can be expanded and and just can grow over time as new and better information comes in, which is kind of like, uh, it's a little bit not based on, but one of the influences has been in the supplement space for like nutritional dietary supplements. There's a site that's really good and I recommend people check it out, examine.com, and they have a similar approach. It's just break a substance into every category that is relevant to it from pharmacology to specific neurological mechanisms or toxicity, and then just research as much as you can and fill up that category. So that's kind of what I, I try to do. We hope you're enjoying the show so far. We want to let you know that the show is sponsored by you. If you find the show valuable and you have the means, please support us. One way to do so without spending a dollar, though, is to rate and review us on iTunes or your preferred podcast app. Each individual new rating that we receive seems to go a long way in helping us reach a wider audience. If donating a few dollars is reasonable for you, then please donate to the show at patreon.com slash the social exchange. Your contribution helps us update audio equipment and software and enhance the quality of the show. And it also helps with things like travel for interviews as well as funding for the forthcoming Families for Sensible Drug Policy podcast. The first episode of the Families for Sensible Drug Policy podcast will actually be airing very soon. The beginning of September will keep you posted. In return for your donation, we make sure that you get early access to all of our shows, bonus content, that's Patreon only, and several other personalized rewards. Again, to donate, go to patreon.com slash the social exchange. And as we do every episode, we'd like to thank all of our regular supporters. Sherry Chandler, Dee Dee Stout, Christopher Hanlon, Henri Pompel, Carter Vermont, which is a nonprofit here in Vermont, founded by Dr. Rick Barnett, Ann M. Earl, Inigo, John Holt, Layla, Mary Kay Villaverde, Michelle, Nancy, Sean, Regina Ferguson, Timmy Tucker, Christian, Tom Rhodes, Kathleen Cochran, Marjorie Israel, Diane T., Trevor, Susan Matthew, and Linda Rhodes. Thank you all so much for your continued support. It helps us more than you may know. And now back to Seth Fitzgerald. I imagine there have been times that you've surprised yourself about what you've discovered about a particular drug. And so insofar as that's true, can you tell me about a time that you believed one thing about a drug and then convinced yourself otherwise through research? Hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. And I know it has occurred as a general response that occurs frequently enough that the reason it's hard to give a specific example is because yeah. for the past few years, as a result of researching, I've just kind of abandoned having a hard position or even a strong any kind of position on something prior to doing this level of research, because I realize I have have historically always ended up in a different position, some notably measurably different position after doing the research than I had before. So a lot of people have an opinion on a substance based on some press articles they've read or based on a few scientific studies. But then once you get into the full literature, it just it balloons into something so much more complex and often painting a very different picture that it 
it just is not wise to have strong opinions going in. So I'm trying to think of what I had a big opinion of before. I know I've changed my opinion, not necessarily based on research articles, but I definitely had different opinions on psychedelics, thinking they were much more, <laughs> I, I almost think they're similarly beneficial now as I did before, but I had a more general promotional type perspective towards mm. them and, and was the kind of person who would be recommending or desiring to go to Peru to drink ayahuasca. Like I was that kind of person at the time. <laughs> and then through research, I just shifted in a scientific direction, not because I learned that that view of psychedelics is false. It's not um, at the level of you can have life changing and beneficial or negative experiences, but uh, just not being as naive, not not kind of viewing any substance as as nearly as powerful for good or bad as I did in the past. So uh, even I had an inclination to to view cannabis as totally benign or uncomplicated. It was just a clear cut. This is the equivalent of some coffee every day thing where it really isn't. And it is still relatively benign compared to some behaviors, but it, uh, or activities, but it's, it's not perfectly benign. And then I, I'm sure I was at some point biased against the methamphetamines and heroines of the world. And that has changed as well, but no, uh, I don't have a great example of a, of a strongly held opinion in the past few years that has changed just because I, I honestly just try to shy away from having opinions yeah. before the research has told me what to think. Right. That's the game itself. I remember when I heard for the first time years ago that most people who do drugs, even drugs like heroin or meth or cocaine, do so without any real life problems. They just do drugs sometimes and then they take care of their responsibilities. I was blown away by that. I believed it with some degree of confidence. Uh, but not confident enough to just tell people that my my new epiphany because, I don't know, I guess I must not have believed it enough to be confident enough to back it up. And that was a real, I, I can really distinctly remember that. But now when I learn something new about drugs or addiction or just be human development or behavior, I, like you say, don't feel an enormous shift in my mindset or belief system because I go in with an open mind. I, I suppose you're saying you feel similarly. You're you go into researching things expecting to learn something new, not with an idea that you already know something, or you already know what you need to know about it. That's why mm -hmm. you do research. Yeah, for any big popularly discussed substance, I, I tend to just go in thinking, you know, I, I need to approach it with an open mind. And I'm probably going to end up having an opinion that is pretty neutral because there is going to be evidence on both sides of this topic. And for any individual person, something could be good or bad, but it's going to be individual and that has to be taken into consideration. So, I mean, the only, the only time that that ends up not being the case is sometimes there's so much bias in, in the literature for, for like, there's some substances, medications that seem to be getting approved with just abysmally little scientific backing and, and the promotional material just is painting a different picture and the doctors are paint, painting a different picture. And that's where an opinion could shift because you're, you're prior to going into the research and then prior to, to seeing the criticisms of the research, noting, you know, there's been three studies likely fully biased in mm. the decision to publish, uh, uh, to publish the paper. And you, you could look at those three papers and think that, you know, know something about it. And that I've definitely fallen into that trap before because it, it's unfortunate that you can't just look at the research and get the full story the second that financial considerations are at play. And even, even non-financial considerations, there's a lot of papers that are very concerning about popular recreational drugs, for example, in being published in uh, the Middle East or in parts of Asia, like China. And that's not to say they're all wrong or bad, but for some reason, the information being published there is just much more concerning than the stuff being published and, and what's been published for even decades in some cases in other countries. And you just have to wonder if just as pharmaceutical companies could push for a positive perception of their 
drug in the literature if certain government funding agencies could kind of push and guide research in a negative direction at times. So even the literature is has its own problems. And yeah, it's just uh, you're, you're best off usually going in with with an open mind and then still being not very strong in your opinion once you have done the research, because there's a good chance that some other factor is could be affecting your what you gain from that literature. What's a favorite episode that you've made so far? Favorite episode? Uh, a lot of the recent content I've been just really happy with. I'm trying to think of which drugs have been covered recently. I mean, the antidepressant withdrawal thing was good. Uh, coverage of DXM was interesting. Just seeing the, the really wide range of conditions that it shows some promise for. And yeah, it is hard to pick a, a favorite, though. I, I tend to somewhat fall in love with every topic because even though drugs are usually less powerful for good or for bad than people tend to believe, they are still very fascinating and have a wide set of applications in a lot of situations. So so just seeing for any of these substances, if you go through the videos, you'll probably end up just as I initially did, learning some new aspect of the substance than you had even heard of before. More recently, you started a podcast, less of a, you know, a direct informational video and more of a an, an open dialogue with somebody that maybe you're interested in. And that's something you do long form and unrehearsed and you've taken it in a slightly different direction. What inspired you to start doing podcast interviews? Well, it's it's been great to talk with people like yourself on there. And it is so, so there's just people that I read stuff from or watch content from. And it's nice to have an additional conversation. And, you know, a lot of times in reading or watching something, I have my own questions. And luckily, TDC provides a platform where I could ask those questions if I think that they the answers to them are likely to be relevant to other people. But another factor is just whether somebody's a journalist who's been who has been really digging into a topic, uh, like I've had uh, Christopher Moraff in Philadelphia, who knows a ton about the local drug market and opioid market and, and sees all of that. And there's just going to be more to learn from somebody like himself about the opioid situation there, heroin situation, than I could learn from reading some research papers. And then the same applies to scientists. If I just, with my, uh, with my background, try to interpret everything that I'm reading in the scientific literature, I'm probably going to end up providing listeners with less information or, yeah, probably less information than if I got the scientist who did the research on to talk about it because they can provide a more detailed and uh, informed perspective. So there's just, it's just a recognition that as much as I think I'm a good person to provide a lot of this information and to, you know, to collect and synthesize and publish, there are a lot of perspectives out there and a lot of backgrounds that are incredibly useful and trying to provide people a platform to, to reach a wider audience via TDC to share that information that I just would never be able to really provide on my own is is great. And the conversations have been great. Unfortunately, I'm pretty slow at releasing episodes, but I'm sure you can probably, or almost any podcaster can relate to uh, finding themselves in the situation of really needing to get stuff out and somehow it falling by the wayside and <laughs> yeah. leaving listeners hanging at times. But, uh, yeah. but, but it's fun. People aren't hearing this until 2024. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is. It gets overwhelming sometimes. Do you ever think mm -hmm. about, since you have the platform now, and I don't know, it feels like your podcast, it doesn't seem as, um, your audience isn't as dependent on it. It's almost like it's good if you can get it. Whereas your content, YouTube content, which are more direct messaging about drugs and facts, um, it, it seems like people are more interested in you getting that content out faster. Does that could put you in a space where you can be creative about who you want to talk to? And if so, have you thought about reaching out to, to intellectuals you respect 
respect and admire who maybe have nothing to do directly with drugs, but but could offer some profound wisdom about how to think about your area? Well, a wider range of guests would definitely be useful. And as long as they are still fairly related to drugs in some way, uh, that would be applicable. I try to keep TDC, even though I have a lot of interests and there are a lot of people that I would love to have conversations with. I do really try to keep it just specific to this topic. And I could easily see myself at some point having a second podcast or a second YouTube channel that has a wider set of content that I find interesting, but is not really related to drug education or harm reduction in any real sense. Because I do try to respect that people there, if TDC were to become 10% other stuff, they, a lot of listeners, listeners would not mind, but they subscribed at a time when it was 100% one thing and providing something that remains a pure source of a certain, uh, remains a pure resource about a certain topic is, is useful. Uh, as to the, the other point, I mean, I kind of treat the podcasts and the videos in a similar way where I have found myself pretty lucky that listeners treat the content as evergreen, especially any of the recent content for the past couple of years, because that's about two, three years ago is when my more comprehensive way of researching stuff kicked in and the content released since then has been just of a different standard than the earliest stuff. So I don't feel as much pressure to release consistently because people in 6, 12, 24 months, it's still going to be relevant to them, possibly even much past that date. And the content kind of, it's just a large resource for people to digest and people treat it that way. There's for YouTube channels, especially, and then probably for podcasts to an extent, it's often a source of entertainment or expecting something every Friday and they want this in the same way they want a TV show, but you know, more educational often. And for whatever reason, I don't get the sense. I mean, people want more content. Of course, it's always good, but they do respect that. Uh, there are some kinds of YouTube channels or podcasts that would rather release every three months and have it be this substantial thing. And I'm not comparing myself in any way to some of the podcasts that immediately come to mind that do that, like Hardcore History, for example, you know, going to release a three hour thing and and that's going to be every few months. And, uh, and it's just a different way of approaching this and everybody kind of respects that. And I kind of treat the YouTube videos like that. I figure people would, uh, <laughs> would rather me work on something for two months and have it be comprehensive in a way that other content online just does not then release things more consistently, but that is more of something you could find by just looking at four websites. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but that that's kind of how I approach it. And I just do feel lucky that, that the viewers and listeners in my own perception of the content pretty much overlap with treating it as educational and therefore not as a, as in need of, of constant new output. Sounds like you've found or a demographic has found you and most of those people are respectful about and understanding about what it means to create meaningful educational content. That's, that's probably lucky all the way around. I'm going to, oh, uh, certainly yeah. I feel, yeah. I feel lucky quite often. I've been surprised that, uh, over the past few years to see the channel and the podcast grow like they have, it, it honestly is still surprising to me that people like that kind of information to the extent that they do. And it's encouraging and, and I'm definitely grateful for that audience. I'm going to um, clip this, I think, but maybe maybe there are a few things throughout the podcast. What I'm trying to do now is offer patrons an opportunity to hear bonus content if they subscribe at a certain level. So here's maybe a, this might be a, just a bonus question or if if it seems like it flows and it coheres to the rest of the interview, maybe I'll just cut out me saying this. You were talking about different interests and, you know, you want to keep, you want to stay on topic. You know, your list people subscribe to your podcast with the idea that they're going to get a certain range of information from you. What are, what are other interests of yours that you could imagine yourself um, creating content around? 
Uh, there's a lot of history that's not related to drugs and a lot of, I mean, philosophy often doesn't really overlap with drugs. Occasionally it does when you get into some of the psychedelic topics, though I've mostly shied away from those, those just because I think I've run my course with them. And so that kind of stuff, some of the humanities are just interesting. And I, I can also imagine, because I do have a, a big interest in general scientific uh biology and chemistry topics that are not drug related per se, it would be nice to eventually cover those because I am uh, intending on on a doctorate in these fields and I like it to that extent. So it's not just about drugs and I wouldn't want to, to overburden TDC with, uh, with stuff, even if it's scientific and even if it's cellular and molecular biology topics, they're not all drug stuff necessarily. However, the issue here and is, and I think a lot of people um, can think of examples of this, is because it's so easy to create content nowadays that people, just because they have some level of interest in in things like history or science or philosophy, uh, they you can approach that as a amateur in a way that is really good content, but you can also approach it in a way where you turn into a stereotypical armchair philosopher, armchair expert on these things. And I, def I definitely do not want to find myself in that situation. So I try not to comment on things that are too far outside of my expertise, which is why I think creating content maybe as a platform to really highlight the conversation aspect, talking with other people who really do know what they're talking about in history or philosophy, but me asking questions that I think are useful, that could be good. I just don't want to you know, it may be fine in a one on one conversation to act like, you know, something about philosophy. But realistically, I have my limitations or, you know, history, and I do not know nearly as much about those things as I do about drugs. So it is nice to anything that's really emphasizing my thoughts on something. I think that'll always remain a pretty, a pretty small area, you know, drugs, harm reduction. That's my expertise. I think It'll remain that way for the foreseeable future. But other stuff, conversations about the other topics are great to have. And, and I can definitely imagine doing something in those areas so long as I don't <laughs> don't turn into that armchair type person. <laughs> I, I feel you. I'm stuck in that fork in the road, too, by the way. I, I When I started the show, I was that armchair person. And I think I've grown out of that a little bit. But So I started with just anything that interested me at all. So I've got these interviews with... You know, Michael Shermer from Skeptic or Carol Tavris, yeah. Charles Murray. And when I started interviewing people more. You get in trouble with some of those. Uh, yeah, well, it's particularly, particularly Charles Murray. Yeah. That was my, my first. I didn't know whether I made it or to be scared when I got my first hate mail. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. so people, when I started interviewing people about drugs, harm reduction, addiction, human development, people were like, what the hell are you doing, man? This has nothing to do with social science. And so I'd go back and then people would say, what are you doing? This has nothing to do with drugs. So I, I don't really know what to do except maybe create a, a new set of content or just to keep doing what I'm doing and pretend I don't hear the, <laughs> the comments. So Seth, you're uh, with a few minutes left, I do want to be careful of your time. You're, you're careful and conscientious about what you talk about, but you're also, you're really progressive in the sense, I mean, you're well-researched, but you're progressive in the sense that I think you're doing something kind of daring. It's somewhat disagreeable and radical from a certain perspective that to be talking openly and honestly, God, that sounds so perverse to say, but like it or not, I guess what I'm saying is I think many people have a sense that you're not supposed to be saying the things you're saying. Do you get resistance for what you're doing? Do you mean talking about is I personal drug use or just my way of approaching the education about the topic? I meant the latter, but either, really. I, I wonder if what kinds of pushback you get for having, you know, the whole broad range of experiences you have on, on creating yeah. your content. Yeah, with with the way that I create the content and the way I approach it, there are certainly valid criticisms. And I think the, the best criticisms and areas where I could be wrong are in things like when I'm loosely promoting some kind of change in policy, there are easily good disagreements that can be had about those topics. Uh, there are people who are 
very well informed and come to more conservative perspectives about how drug policy should be handled, how education in something like middle schools or high schools would be handled. And often those views are coming from people who have much more formal education in something relevant to education or relevant to public policy. So I take those things into consideration. And that's why it's not a big part of what I do. I don't really, I'm not primarily an activist trying to push things in a particular direction, because I do think once it gets to the, gets to those areas, there are just so many disagreements that I, I wouldn't want to be seen as, as kind of getting out of bounds. But with education, when it comes to just what TDC does for just providing straight factual information, I don't know that that can really be argued against. When people do argue against it, and I do get complaints, it usually is at the level of just, how dare you talk about this stuff? These things are dangerous. How are you acting like you won't get into trouble with going down this path? And I understand the impulse to feel that way. However, based on everything that we know about drugs, that's not really a valid concern. There, there is the case that if all of society were to adopt a looser stance towards drugs, there would be some increase in use. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that being scared about the effects of heroin and methamphetamine keep a lot of people from ever trying them. And for some people, that means avoiding a lifetime struggle with those things. But overall, when we look at sort of global impact, what kind of education is, is best? I don't know that it ever makes sense to stray from facts, especially in a, in a day and age when it's so easy to find out that if you're being somewhat misled, that you are being misled. It's just, it's a lot harder to get that kind of, of propaganda, if you want to call it that kind of a inflammatory term, but to get that to work because mm. some of it just sounds ridiculous and people know they're being duped and then they tune out. And that's my usual go-to line, especially when talking about high school students, because that was my experience in high school. And I know that was the experience for a lot of people. It's now probably more common than it was in 1970 for people in classrooms when drugs are being talked about, you know, in classrooms being a microcosm for everywhere else, that you have kids uh, debating the teachers because you get the handful of kids who are comfortable doing so and have a different perspective, know that some of the stuff they're being told, even in a place like where I grew up, it was fairly liberal. It wasn't, it wasn't crazy. And it wasn't even, it was abstinence only in the sense that they were not saying, take X milligrams of cocaine to have fun. <laughs> like, you know, that's a level which is, is, uh, even I am not sure about promoting. Sharp they weren't your... doing that, but they were not saying, you know, everybody who tries this stuff is going to get ruined. It was, uh, honestly, they were approaching a lot of drugs similar to how, uh, a lot of people approach alcohol. Like, this is an issue. This can become an issue for people. Here are some of the health effects. We're not going to talk about the benefits. That's usually the thing that's left out. But they weren't going too crazy in terms of making up stuff. They weren't saying everybody who takes LSD becomes psychotic for forever. Like that stuff, I'm sure still exists in some parts of the country and some parts of the world. But it's not really uh, what I experienced. But when it comes to, you know, if you're going to tell people stuff, either they're not they're coming into hearing about drugs with no interest. And I don't think the mention that a drug has a positive effect, which probably everybody knows, even if you're not interested in cocaine, you know that it does something positive for some people. I don't think most people grow up thinking these drugs are exclusively bad, especially a substance like that. They may for something like methamphetamine for whatever reason. Um, but for the most part, they know there is some good potential, but they have already chosen that. Eh, it's not really for me. I'm not, really inclined. And then you have other people who are more interested, more likely to use. And if you miss that opportunity of talking with them to provide valuable information about here's how to stay safe if you ever do make this choice, then I think it is a real missed opportunity. So you, you're you going to provide the information. The people who are not going to use probably are still not going to use, but the people who are going to use, which is if we include all drugs, even just all recreational drugs, is a very large percentage of the population for experimenting at some time or using consistently at some time, then those people are may never 
get good information. It's very easy, even if drugs have been talked about in social settings and educational settings for years and you've been exposed to that, it's very possible to end up in adulthood using things and having almost no clue about even what dosages are and what safety information should be known. So the fact that that opportunity is regularly being missed, I just think the benefits, the likely benefits so consistently outweigh the potential risks that it's a pretty understandable way to approach drugs. And I think the biggest question is is whether my approach is right for once you initially initiate this discussion at 13 years old, whether my videos would be what you would provide. I don't know. For certain kids, it probably is fine. Like for me at 13, it probably would be a reasonable thing to provide. But as an educational policy, a curriculum, I'm not so sure. And that's why I don't you know, claim to be an expert on childhood or, or teenage education. There's much better experts than myself on what can motivate uh, kids to pursue better behaviors and be safe. Uh, but for the most part, the people I'm talking to, I think the way that my, I think my approach to it is just rational and reasonable. And I'm always open to concerns and criticisms. I've definitely somewhat adjusted my way of talking about these things over time. And I do really try to present as much of the concerns as, as the positives nowadays. You know, the, the positive effect description should not be 10 minutes when the con- discussion about the uh, negative effects is 10 seconds. So mm. a brief mention of, oh, you may have a heart attack, but you preceded that with 10 minutes of you're going to have the best time of your life. Well, that's not really education. So moving further in the direction of really being balanced is is important. But but for the the overall approach, I do think it's, it's sound. And of course, it's not like I'm drawing on research. These things should be tested. And it's encouraging that curriculums that are different, like those supported by Drug Policy Alliance and others, are beginning to sort of move into schools. And there's a bright future for research into what tactics are best. But, uh, you know, especially since I'm targeting primarily adults or later teens, I I think that's just the best way to to deal with it. You have, like I said earlier, nearly 150,000 subscribers to your YouTube channel. Has anything about that number changed the way that you produce or provide or think about your content than when you had, say, only 1,000 subscribers? Definitely. I just cannot, not that I ever felt like I could get things wrong, but for anything at all important, we're not talking about like a date of manufacture or something like that, but anything really consequential, I just can't get it wrong. And and if I do happen to get it wrong, that content has to be removed. I've gone through and removed primarily older things now that I've tried to employ some more stringent uh, research methodology and confirming the facts that I'm providing. I usually don't have to fix or remove newer content, but older content, I just remove. I have no hesitation about doing so. And just when you have that kind of audience, you do have a responsibility. And this is why uh, not to get into it too much, but I'm I'm very hesitant, hesitant, and very just generally uh, concerned about anything drug entertainment like. So I don't really get into that field, mm. but occasionally I could in a certain discussion on, say, a podcast, where getting perhaps a bit loose in my way of talking about substance, uh, yeah, about substances. But for some people, entertainment is a huge part of their way of talking about drugs, and I think that's pretty risky. And, and people who have that focus easily fall into some pretty significant mistakes and oversights just because they're not focused on the science, which is fine. And not everybody's a scientist, not everybody's a researcher, not everybody has that impulse. But you can't, on something like drugs, provide wrong information about the safety aspects or the effects. And so I really just, I don't allow that to happen on TDC. And like I said, if something makes it through nowadays, I'm just very, very fast to not, you know, debate it or issue a little correction in the the comments or something like a, a common response to the videos. No, just you got to take it down. I mean, you have to, if there's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who could be impacted, and a lot of those people are 
you may be the only thing they hear about something, you can't be providing wrong information. I just don't think it's responsible. There's been a lot of talk about YouTube censorship and also YouTube demonetization of, of some channels of late. Has this impacted you in any way? It did for a time. It The channel at one point was removed, then it was restored a couple months later. And, and then a couple of years later, more recently, it uh, received a couple of strikes. So for those who don't know, if you get three strikes, your channel is terminated. And I was at two and they came kind of back to back. It was at a time when Clearly, there had been some shift in the algorithm for YouTube for detecting harmful and dangerous content. And it's understandable why something about drugs could easily trigger that. And unfortunately, YouTube is supposed to and presents itself as having a verification system where once you appeal something, there should be some kind of manual review. And either there's no manual review and they're just still leaving decisions even up to to algorithms or the manual review people are, I mean, it's understandable how they would be biased about drugs and not under, not be able to see what's harmful versus what's educational. Uh, but yeah, so TDC did end up in that situation. Luckily through some back channeling, essentially there's some people who like TDC who work at YouTube and they were able to fix it behind the scenes because none of the formal process worked for me. And if I didn't happen to have, these contacts, then it would have been terminated and hopefully had been restored because eventually YouTube, after a month or two, it did kind of get itself into gear and fix the algorithm overreach. But it would still be a much bigger concern of mine. And I'd be pretty worried about the future of TDC if I didn't have these contacts. So that's not a comfortable position to be in. Mm. I understand the position that YouTube and Facebook and Twitter are in. I mean, they they probably should be more uh, responsible, especially almost all of their way of operating is not just sending out the stuff that you post, but also in some way promoting it by sending it to specific people or giving certain posts a boost just by algorithm effects. So the second that that comes into play and they're not just kind of a, uh, a town square where anybody can say anything, but nobody's getting amplified – it's understandable why they would have some pretty stringent uh, guidelines. And even myself, when it comes to drugs on YouTube, there are some kinds of videos that definitely probably do deserve age restrictions and demonetization and even being removed. I mean, it's possible I haven't thought about exactly what those videos would be, but it's conceivable that some way of approaching drugs is just reckless and you don't want people getting harmed. And if somebody is giving a entirely reckless guide about how to inject something, perhaps that injection guide should not be on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So there is a role for that. And I, I feel bad for these platforms. I mean, imagine trying to police. I mean, I'm just talking about drugs and I can see how, how varied the content is and how hard it would be to pick what's right and what's wrong and what should be provided, especially if you're, you're trying to distinguish accurate from inaccurate. I mean, not everybody's an expert. So how do you evaluate this stuff? But then there's on top of drugs, 3000 other uh, types of content that are out there and topics to be covered. So I understand it. And yeah, so that's a long answer to yes, YouTube has been an issue. Luckily, it's not right now. Hopefully it doesn't become one in the future. This might end up having to trail into a, another conversation we have. But would you have been able to like looking back now with the benefit of hindsight, is there is there advice you could give your former self about how to avoid such um, such an interaction with YouTube. And l actually, let me say it this way. I, right now, like most of my listeners are, are through like iTunes or Stitcher or things like that. I don't, I think I make, mm -hmm. I, I do make YouTube videos, but I don't really do anything on YouTube. They just get generated there. And right now I get between five to 10,000 listens on average. And th that's substantial. And I know that there are ways that I could, uh, elevate that number. I know that I could reach out to more people and do more uh, networking, whatever. But I, I'm sort of scared to. I'm like, I I have this idea that I really need to think about it because if I if I grow my platform, then there is always this this um, this thing that could happen where where I become demonetized or I become you know I or I get strikes on a platform and maybe it's not even a human being doing it. So 
what if I get yeah. if I get too big, let's say, then then is it possible that I could be reduced to where I was at the beginning? And and so anyway, do you have advice for a me or for a, a younger you? It's a bit hard to give advice because it's so it's often really unclear what is triggering. I mean, initially even if there is some kind of manual review at some point for, for Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, initially this stuff is really operating off of either reports from users and those, I think I've probably received them before, but they're just coming from people who dislike the video mm-hmm. and their way of getting back at me is, is to report it. And then the algorithm kicks in or a manual, manual review kicks in and causes trouble. Um, so it's either that reporting or it just being picked up for whatever reason and it's so random at times. I and mean, one of the things that got a strike was just a podcast with, I believe it was the Dance Safe founder, Emmanuel Sferios. And there was nothing about that. It's, it's, it's much more benign of a conversation than a lot of my videos could be perceived as sure. um, the regular videos. So the fact that that was a thing that got a strike and was removed, there was just, I mean, why? So it is hard when you don't know what about a piece of content is triggering when other things from myself or from other channels who are more entertainment focused just completely fly under the radar it does seem a bit random i mean i would just recommend you know just to use some kind of sense but but honestly that it's really not that helpful because whether content is accurate or inaccurate appeals have never worked for me i don't think i've maybe gotten like one age restriction overturned on appeal but that means there's been uh, removals or restrictions in one or two dozen other cases that were never overturned, even though I I felt entirely justified. And then I found out upon talking with employees there that I was justified. I just somehow got denied. The fact that that's the system, it is just, I understand your impulse to fly under the radar because it does seem like your best bet. Just don't get picked up. And there's don't, people don't on, succeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just limit yourself, you know, set <laughs> polls and you'll always be fine. Yeah. You know, don't have an audience that that is in some way what's promoted. And you do have probably some bigger target on your back when you have a, a million and a half subscribers as opposed to 5000. But even then, some of the small channels that have the lowest chance of making some noise mm-hmm. when they get unfairly targeted to get things overturned, because honestly, the biggest justice in these systems comes at the outrage at the complaint level once something bad has happened so once you have an audience who can support you you'll end up getting a response from at team youtube on twitter being like oh we want to fix this issue now that a bunch of people are complaining to us but (laughs) the normal system does not work so if you have three followers you're you actually are kind of out of luck if Mm. you somehow get targeted but otherwise you have some recourse and i only have recourse not because it's necessarily social media stuff, but because the audience was large enough to happen to include some YouTube employees. So then I got a benefit and other people with larger channels have contacts at YouTube in a more formal sense. So yeah, I mean, it's it's probably a wash for, you know, I would not legitimately recommend to limit, uh, especially your kind of content, which is like, is entirely non-objectional. I can't see anything that should be an issue. Uh, of course, that's my opinion and not YouTube's uh, bot's opinion, probably. Yeah, that's going to be your third but, strike now. <laughs> yeah. And, and honestly, I wish I could channel into that bot and see what it's thinking, but I can't. Well, I'm, I probably am going to in the next few days, next few months, maybe uh, just go ahead and dive into the deep end. But uh, if you get a letter from me that just says help, you'll know what, know what happened. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> I will. Seth, it's been awesome talking to you. Anything that I've missed about you or your content and work that you think would be important for my listeners to be aware of? No, I think that's it. If they just want to learn more, then I do recommend going to mainly youtube.com slash the drug classroom and then the drug classroom.com. Both are fine. And yeah, it was great being on again and I enjoyed the conversation. So thanks for having me. Sure. And I'll provide those links in the show notes. Again, folks, I'm speaking with Seth Fitzgerald. Seth, again, thanks so much for being with me.
Thank you.